I said it before many times. I wrote it in the newsletter. And I'm going to say it again. I am confident it will not be long before I disappoint you. It's been on my mind a lot this last week as I try to catch what is a, an avalanche of tiny snowballs of information. It's all good. I'm, I'm enjoying it very much. I miss this kind of work tremendously. It's part of why I really wanted to come back to the parish, to be in the middle of the hurricane, as it were, and to know so many people's lives and needs on so many levels, from the inactive member who has got a terminal diagnosis, but we now know about that I need to try to see, right? Down to uh, the band event that happened yesterday morning. So much. All of it good. Trying to catch it. Yeah? And not lose it. And in this, what I said before about expectations and what you believe I'm here to do and what I believe I'm here to do is bound to bring us to a point where either because I just missed the snowball or because I am coming with an express call and command from God to do a very specific thing, I am going to disappoint you. Now, if I disappoint you because of my humanity, I beg your forgiveness, and I will be more than willing to bow my head and say, that was poorly played, let me try again. If I disappoint you because of what the Word of God says and my commitment to standing on it, there's not much I can do for you other than to say, this is what it is, my friend. Let us attend to the scriptures together and both be under the one who is over us all. Now, why do I say this? Well, because I'm convinced I've already put my foot in it a little bit somewhere, and you don't have to know where. But it's going to happen again and again. And then on top of all of this, our text for today from Mark chapter 10 is all about misguided expectations, requests to a leader to do a certain thing, and that leader saying, I'm going to do what God sent me to do then leads into a discussion about the relationship that Christians have with each other and Christians have with their pastors and pastors have with their Christians. Amazingly, the whole conversation demonstrates the concupiscence, that's an old-fashioned word for the nincompoopery of mankind, the, the idiocy that our flesh has to not understand the things that really matter. You heard it read about how James and John come up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, we need your help. What do you need, guys? I love you. We want to be kings. But that is immediately following Jesus having a conversation with his chosen 12 in which he says these things. Look. Look. We're going to Jerusalem right now, and I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. They're going to condemn me to death. They're going to deliver me, deliver me over to the pagans. They will mock me. They will spit on me. They will flog me, and they will murder me. And then three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. Hey, Jesus, yeah, can we be like on your right hand, your right, on your left hand when you get all that power, please? See how misguided the question is. Ignoring entirely the tremendous angst, agony, and suffering this king is going to go for, go through for them. To then ask for a higher place when it all works out? Is it not enough to open the doors in the house of the Lord and simply have a seat at the table? Do we really need to rule? Is that not who we are? 
each and every one of us. That we come into our Lord's presence with expectations of what he should do for us. Rather than with a begging, pleading, Lord have mercy, open hands, Lord Jesus, thy will be done. Right? Now, I say all of this to emphasize that we're all on the wrong side and we're all, as Christians, on the right side. We all have the fleshly inherited habit of the wrong ideas coming right out of our hearts every day. And we all also have been placed into the covenant of Jesus' blood so that by faith we do desire God's will. We hunger for it. The new covenant writes it not merely on tablets of stone, but upon our hearts so that awakened and renewed to think with the word of God, we begin to truly desire what God wills and align ourselves with it. The cross that you and I really bear in the present is not actually made of wood, but is that wrong-headed flesh that is fused with this new nature man and faith. And that we bear with not only my own sin in this, but that as I see my need, my error, Jesus covering my faith, that you and you and you and you and you all have that same struggle going on, and there's going to be times where that flesh wins. And it doesn't mean that we hate each other. It doesn't mean that we're not Christians. What it means is that we are given an opportunity to actually forgive, to truly overlook a wrong. See, forgiveness is not some nice pie-in-the-sky thing about everybody's happy doing whatever they want. Forgiveness is when you are authentically hurt. And you hold it, and you don't hurt back. The only path to this is not for me to tell you how that's what we ought to be doing. I can't chide you into that kind of behavior. All I can do is tell you that Jesus of Nazareth is enough to both forgive the wrong and to promise the right, and that his work of word and sacraments is going to affect that in you personally and in you corporately over the course of a lifetime, leading to a greater day where in the twinkling of an eye, all of it is wiped away in the death and the destruction and the ignorance part, and the only thing that remains is that new man, perfect and able to love entirely. Amen. Amen. The question of James and John is misguided. We will have misguided expectations. I'll have them too. I want this place to just grow and boom, get big. And I want to do it in specific ways with really awesome high liturgy, processional crosses, and maybe even incense at evening services. That might be too much for all of you. And we might need to have conversations about where the middle lies. But if we all come to that table recognizing that if the word of God says it, we're doing that, right? And if some other thing out there is not doing that, we're not going to do or deal with that thing. We're not going to put our lives and our minds in danger as a community, well, then the rest of it, the actual adiaphora, right? The actual things neither commanded nor forbidden, we'll all be fine getting through those. Back to the text to see how Jesus handles this. Can you hear in his voice both a little bit of anger at James and John and his compassion? Hey, Jesus, we want to be on your right hand and on your left when the most awesome thing ever happens. They're thinking, reigning on the last day. Jesus is thinking, I'm dying for the sins of the world. It's what I was just talking about. It's what my glory really is. I'm going to be crucified, all that stuff. And he just says to them, you don't know what you're talking about. 
guys, you really want to be crucified next to me? Is that really what you want? (laughs) Are you able to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Oh yeah, Jesus, we are. They don't even know. They don't even know what they're asking for. He tells them, you're actually going to. You're going to die a brutal martyr's death. All of the apostles, with the exception of St. John, did. All, often, not often, but in various ways, worse deaths, more nasty deaths than Jesus himself received. So, for sure, guys, you're going to get it. But, he says, to be crucified beside me, to sit at my right and at my left, is not mine to grant, but for those for whom it has been prepared. And you, of course, remember from the accounts of his crucifixion that at his right and at his left there are two thieves who are also crucified. And one of them rails against him in unbelief, and one of them although it would seem, according to one gospel, also railed against him in unbelief, while still on the cross, is converted and repents and believes and begs for mercy and is promised that Jesus will grant it to him that very day. The right and the left, I guess I could do it this way, your right, your left, but really it is, it is correctly this way because it's an image of a king. And the king would have on his right hand the one who is most cherished, most prized, his right-hand man. We still use that language today. It's not that the left would necessarily be somebody bad. The king wouldn't have someone bad beside him. But it certainly would be a lower position. This carries over then into the way in which judgment takes place. And Jesus talks this way in the parable on the sheep and the goats, where on the last day he will divide all mankind, and on his right he will place the sheep, the ones whom he cherishes, the ones who belong to him. And on his left, now it is a bad place, right? It's not so good. He places the goats, those who do not believe, and they go off into fiery judgment, though they go the whole way saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we believe? And he says, no, you didn't. You have no idea who I am. Right and left, two men on the cross, a picture of judgment, and Jesus at the middle. That's all he gives here, right, is go in there in the text. We're going there next week to watch it all happen. Meanwhile, the other apostles, who really don't know what I just said to you either, they're all living in ignorance. They hear about James and John trying to get a leg up on the best seats at the party, And what do they do? Do they forgive? No. They become indignant. They get angry. He's not doing what he ought to do. So imagine this now. This is when you come to me and tell me about that other person who ought to be doing something different. Or when you go to that other person and talk about how Pastor Fisk ought to be doing something different. It's called triangling. It's a way of using other people to manipulate your power without ever having to talk to another person that might confront you, disagree with you, and need your forgiveness. That's what they do. So Jesus calls them. He says, guys, I got to tell you how it really ought to be. Out amongst the rulers of the nations, those who have power, when they get it, what do they do? They use it to lord it over others. They use it for themselves. It shall not be so among you. The best way to try to understand God's good gift of authority and power is to go to the place in creation where it all flows from, which is not the king. It's not the pastor. It's the father and the son. Now you can include the mother in this too. You're very much a part of it. But the father and mother over the child, the moment that child is born, have complete and absolute tyranny over that child. Why? For themselves? 
for the child. Because that child, without the tyranny, the good tyranny, right? The good authority of the parents would die within days. Within days. There's no life. And so you see how authority is vested into the family relationship as a way of serving the one who is weakest. Power is given not to be used for what you want, but for what the one you have power over needs. Now this is what they call the heavy weight of the crown, which all good kings know. This is a struggle every parent knows as they strive to figure out as that child grows. How do I best wield this authority? And certainly, as we all fail, my children will tell you, do I get angry too often? Oh, no? Oh, they're very kind. Uh, I definitely lose my cool, fail to forgive, fail to show patience. Even so, what Jesus has said here to his apostles is that amongst we who are Christians, we have this awakening created by his forgiveness which empowers us to see the good, to want the good, to strive for that good, and when we fail to reach it, to not hate each other on account of that, but to return together to the same place where we all need forgiveness. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be a slave. This is not to say that there is no good ordering of things, that there is no place for rightly vested authorities and responsibilities. It is only to say that at the very outset of the entire thing, we are all beggars crawling into this place. And the greatest among us will be those who remember that and are therefore the least. The greatest will never be seen or lauded for what they do, but will only gladly receive a strengthening of forgiveness again and again. The more that any one of us or all of us might shout at each other about all the other things, get frustrated about all the other things, the only thing that's lost, really, is that faith that grows in forgiveness. As distracted from the things that matter, we're busy out there and forgetting what's here, coming even here while thinking about what's out there. Jesus ends with gospel. This verse has been used many times as law, and it always bothers me when it does. Verse 45, he says, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I remember on my vicarage, that was the theme for youth group that year. And it was all about how Jesus served, so you should serve too. true doesn't make Christians though doesn't keep Christians Christian either in fact believed firmly enough eventually will destroy your faith because it's all about you it's something that in other places I have called the gospel write the word law into the middle of the word gospel to try to make the law into good news Sermons that follow this pattern, which all too often you can find if you listen, go like this. The Bible says you shouldn't do this thing. It's wrong, and you probably have done it, so you're a sinner. But Jesus came, and Jesus saved you from all of this by his death on the cross. And actually, that they've gotten that far is pretty good, because a lot of Christian churches don't even go that far. But they've given you the gospel. Here it is. Jesus is your Savior. Oh, oh don't get too excited. I'm going to take it back. You're a sinner. Jesus saved you. So now you can go back to this other law and do it right. Go get going. Gospel. It's a lie. It'll destroy you because it steals from you your hope. You don't get to walk out free. You walk out with yet another chain around your neck to carry you in your guilt. God help us and God preserve me. Let me never do that to you. This has been a law-heavy sermon. All the good ones really are. 
But what I want you to walk away with is not the law, but Jesus fulfilling that law in your place. Jesus doesn't say the Son of Man came to serve so that you would go serve. He says it so that you will know there's actually nothing you can do for him. But that he came to serve you. That the real king who reigns on high, who sends pastors to preach and calls Christians to live, does it all by himself as gift. He came to serve you by giving his life as a ransom, a payment, a blood note for you. My friends, I promise you, so long as that continues to be what I preach and you believe, there is nothing that can kill this church. In the name of Jesus, amen.